I greet you all in Jesus' most precious name. Uh, would you please open in your Bibles with me to Psalm 150? <clears throat> and then later we will also be looking at one verse from the Gospel of John, which is chapter 4, verse 23. So we'll start with Psalm 150, verses 1 to 6. I'm going to request all of us to stand up together for the reading of the Word of God. Amen. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for the reading of your word. As we sit at your feet, let our attitude be like that of Mary, absorbing, listening, taking in, and then converting it into obedient action in our lives. Father, now please add your blessing to the reading of your word. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. This is the last of the Psalms recorded in the book of Psalm. Um, the title of my sermon today is very fundamental, very basic, praise and worship. Uh, I did a teaching a few months back with our singing and music team in our church, and it was interesting uh, because it was a small gathering, uh, it was an intimate gathering, uh, so we could have kind of a question answer and dialogue kind of a time. So in the beginning of the, of the session, I gave all of them a task. I said, okay, in your own words, define what praise is, and in your own words, define what worship is. And I said, write it down and put it aside because I'll need those definitions, uh, and you will need those definitions to compare it with what your understanding after the teaching session. Now, you will imagine that uh, people who are actually involved in the task of singing songs and, and, and playing the music uh, would be very well understood on the uh, meaning of praise and worship. And I was, uh, I was not surprised. I knew uh, that, you know, growing up in, in church, and, and uh, really we take up definitions that are popular, that we are used to, without actually going back into the word. And so what we did that day was we did a word study. We went into the Old Testament. We took out root words in Hebrew, and we expounded on those words, and then we went to the New Testament, and we took this word praise and took this word worship, and we expounded, we found out the meanings of these things. Uh, what are the original meanings? What are the, those particular, there are different words that have been used, and what do those words translate into in the English language? And, and then finally, when we finished the session, I asked all of them, now, in your groups, define again after, after going through the scriptures, define again what praise is and what worship is. And so I'm going to ask you this question. What is praise? Is anyone bold enough to give a definition? Please feel free to do that. What is praise? At least we should pick up something from what we read in Psalm 150. Anyway, you don't have to answer me, uh, you know, but think about it. Think about a definition in your mind. What is worship? You know, many times we, we hear these terminologies that, okay, you know, uh, especially those who are involved in the singing and, and music and all that, they'll say, okay, we will do praise songs, and then we will do, yes, God has standards, and if, in fact, the Holy Scripture reveals those standards for our living. And I believe you will also know that not only that God has standards, that his standards are high. Actually, they are too high for us to achieve. Yet, what is the call that God has called you and me to be 
as born again believers. It is not for us to be who we want to be or who we can be, but it is for us to be who God wants us to be. And what does God want us to be? What is God's definition about himself? God is? God is? Louder. God is? See, that's, that's the mistake we make. Many times we say God is love. What does God say about himself? How does he define himself? I am holy. And then what does he tell you and I to be? Be holy as I am holy. God doesn't define himself as love, while he is the very definition of love. God defines himself as holy. What does the word holy mean? The word holy means to be set apart. Set apart to what and from what? God is set apart from sin unto righteousness. He is set apart away from sin and onto, he is the very definition of righteousness. And that's what holiness. And therefore, God's love is holy love. His mercy is a holy mercy. His compassion is a holy compassion. His judgment is a holy judgment. And that is why the same compassionate and merciful God is the same God who is righteous and the one who judges. Now, why I said all this is, we always try to lower God's standards and bring it down to our standards. Why? Because we are people who love our comfort zones. We don't want to leave our comfort zones. And therefore, we will take scriptures, we will twist their meanings, and we will water it down, and we will bring it down to our level, to the way we feel comfortable about it. Please, let's not make that mistake. Let us always be people who are committed to do God's business in God's way. And therefore also praise and worship. Let us not bring it down to our level. It is not a feel-good time for us. It is all about God. God is at the center of it all. And therefore, whatever praise is that we will find out the meaning today and whatever worship is as we will remind ourselves today, it is all about God, it is all for Him, and it is all unto Him. And we become now the channels, we become now the ones that are bringing out this honor, bringing out this reverence unto God. So let's uh, look at verse by verse in Psalm 150. Verse 1 says, praise the Lord, praise God in His sanctuary, praise Him in His mighty heavens. So where to praise very clear. Praise him in his sanctuary. Now, what is the sanctuary? Sanctuary is the place where you gather together for one reason, and the reason is to honor God. So right now, this is a sanctuary. We have come together in order to honor God. We have not come here for any other agenda. If at all you had any other agenda, you have to let it down, and you have to focus on one agenda, and that is to honor and revere God and to honor his name. So we do that as an individual. It starts in our individual lives. Every born-again Christian, the Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians, it tells us, don't you know that your bodies are the temple of God? So each one of us carries the fragrance and the presence of God on this earth. It's interesting what Jesus taught us to pray. In Matthew chapter, um, chapter 4, 5, we call it the Lord's Prayer. It's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is prayed in, in John chapter 16, 17, where Jesus is praying. This is the believer's prayer. This is what we have been taught how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you, can you picture that? What is the early and beginning and priority part of the prayer? It is not your needs. It's not my needs. You know, what is our, can you, can you think about our prayer life? What does our prayer life consist of? Most probably our prayer life consists of a shopping list that we tell God what we want from him. 
I want this, I want that, I want this. What does our prayer, think about it, what does our prayer life center on? Our prayer life centers on ourselves, our comforts. I want this, I want that, I want security, I want prosperity. But what did God teach us? What did Jesus teach us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, number one, it is relational. You're calling God your Father. Jesus taught us to call God our Father. It is relational. It is not remote. It is not you're tapping into a power for your advantage. That is what all the religions in the world do. What does all the religions in the world do? The, the religions in the world teach and do. They tap into, they want to tap into certain power so that their lives can become more comfortable. Appease deities so that the deities will do some favor in return. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches us that our lives belong to God and it is all about God. So it's not about our comfort. It's not about our needs. It's about him and how we serve and honor him. So it is relational. And that's why the Bible tells us that God wants worship of what kind? The, the kind that is truthful and that is in truth and in spirit, right? What does that mean? How does that stand apart from all the other worships that the whole world is trying to? Because the worship of the world is related to self. What can I get out of this? But in the Bible, it teaches us differently. How do I relate with my heavenly father? What does he want from me? How does he want me to honor and serve him? So call to God in his sanctuary. We as individuals are his sanctuary. And then we come together. We are coming together as a sanctuary. And that is why it's important. You know, you cannot be a Christian on your own. There are many people, and especially the COVID season, has helped us to interpret and understand our faith. The smallest reason people will isolate themselves and be away from fellowship, be away from corporate worship and fellowship. If you go into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is a portion that we use most commonly for at the time of communion, and you will find that when Paul says, what I've received, I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night that he took bread and he broke it and gave it to his disciples, likewise he took the cup, he, he gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and, do, and he said, do this, in remembrance of me until I come again. And then it goes on with certain instructions and says, do not do this in an unworthy manner. And what is the unworthy manner? The unworthy manner is if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if he's not your Lord God and your Savior, and then you pretend, and that becomes hypocrisy, that is unworthy. You're not a believer, but you pretend, you show the others by participating in the communion that you are a believer, that is hypocrisy. That is one. Secondly, you are a believer, but you are carrying offense in your heart towards others. Because over there, very clearly it tells you that you need to recognize the body of Christ. Not only the head, who is Christ, but also the body. And therefore, you cannot be in communion with God when you are not in communion with your fellow believers, when you're carrying offense in your heart towards the horizontal relationship, you cannot have a vertical relationship. God does not honor that kind of a relationship. And therefore, you and I, though we are individuals and though we are believers as individuals, we cannot conduct our Christian life in isolation. Our, our personal devotion is important, our personal time of prayer is important. Everything is important, but also equally important is our corporate life together because that is where you actually get to express true praise, true worship, and true love. Because the Apostle John said, how can you say that you love God that you cannot see when you do not love your own brother that you see? So the litmus test of our faith, the litmus test of our Christian life is not in the very private moments that is, that is important, that is essential because your most private moment should be 
as transparent as your most public moments. There should be consistency, consistency, consistency throughout your life. It should not be one language in your private life and another language in your public life. Your private life and your public life should align itself to heaven in such a way that there is integrity, integrity, integrity through and through, from the time when nobody is watching to the time when everybody else is watching. This is the kind of worshippers God is looking for. We have to worship God together as, a, as an individual, as a community, as a family, as a church, and then as a community. The call to praise God in his mighty heavens. Where do we praise him? It also says praise him in his mighty heavens. Not only are we called to worship on this terrestrial realm, God is calling his heavenly beings to come join us in his worship, in the worship towards him. Why to praise? Verse 2. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. So why should we praise God? Two reasons. First of all, we have to praise God for his mighty acts of power. This is focused on what God does. We praise God for what he does, his great and mighty acts of power. What are these mighty acts of power? Saving a sinner is a mighty act of power because no person can save himself or herself. No one can save another person. It is God and God alone who can save also, our definition of blessings has to change. Many times if you ask someone, what is a blessing, even a born-again Christian, most likely the definition and the answer you will hear back is that blessing is the increase of comfort in my life. When I get a raise in my salary or I get a good profit in my business, when I get a bonus, when I get a new car, when I get all these things are the normal definitions of blessing. But go to the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 4, and read, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Nothing to do with our comfort. So what is blessing? Blessing in its most simple definition from the Bible is bless. A person is blessed when that person walks under the approval of God. If God approves about your walk and your life, then you are blessed. That's what blessedness is all about. And one of the biggest blessings that we receive as a gift from God is the gift of salvation. And therefore, let us not belittle the gift that God has given us. And therefore, let us be careful about our testimony because we are not only asked to live a life that is worthy of God, but we are asked to transfer and transmit it to others, to, to share the gospel. When is the last time that you share the gospel with someone in your lifestyle and in your words? Because it has to be together. You don't just preach the gospel in your words. You preach the gospel by living it out. And then you use words to confirm what you have just lived out. What will people say about you at your place of work? Do they know that you are a born again Christian? Is there a statement in your life that people can see and say, I want to be like that person. I got saved like that when I was in pre-degree here in Marivanius College. And I came from a background where I had no godly upbringing. Our family was not a church-going family. And I, I hardly ever read the Bible till, till my teenage time. When I came here and I, you know, you know how teenagers are, you know, you, you just want to have fun. But there was the lives of few of my friends, ordinary people, but somehow there was something I could not articulate it at that time that attracted me to them. Today I can articulate what it was. It was the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, brotherly love, self-control, against which there is no law. I was attracted to their life and then I used to go to them and ask, I see a difference. I know that you're ordinary people like all of us. But what is it about your life? There is something in your life which I cannot explain and I need that. There is peace in your life that I don't have. I need that peace. There is joy in your life. And that day I learned the difference between the definition of happiness and joy. Happiness is man-centered. Whatever triggers our emotions, that is happiness. Happiness is not a fruit of the spirit. Joy is a fruit of the spirit. Happiness is dependent on our circumstances. 
Something good happens, we feel happy. But joy does not depend upon circumstances. Joy depends upon relationship with God. You may be having the toughest time in your life, but you have a serene peace in your life and you are able to conduct yourself with joy. Why? Because that is the fruit of the spirit. That is not the product of a circumstance or a situation. Despite the circumstance, despite the situation, you are joyful, you are peaceful. Nothing can shake you. You, you are unshaken. That is joy. And then they, when, they, when I asked them this question, they shared the gospel with me. And they continued to minister to me. And then I made a personal confession of Jesus, invited Christ into my life as my Savior, my Lord, and my God. See, many of us stop with receiving Jesus as our Savior. But he comes in a package. He doesn't just come as a Savior where he saves us from our sins and then we can continue to live as we please. He comes as our Lord. And as our God, what does that mean? The word, the terminology, Lord, comes from a relationship between a master and a slave. In that relationship, the master says and the slave does. The slave doesn't have a will of his own, doesn't have a right of his own. He has only the right that the master gives and the master says and the slave does. I came to realize that day that I got born again. That I am, Jesus is not only my savior who saved me from the, the wages of sin, but he also that day became my Lord, which means he says, I do. And not only that, that he that day became my God, and therefore my worship is reserved for him and for him alone, and I cannot take my worship and give it to anything or anyone else. How do you know you worship somebody or something else? Do a mental check, do an audit. What occupies your mind most of the time? What occupies your resources all the time? Where do you spend your money mostly? If you are spending your money mainly in, in a gym, then your God and worship is the gym. And your body building is your God. Now, I'm not saying that you should not take care of your health. You should. But if it is all about that, that's all you can think about. That becomes a worship. For some people, your spouse is is your God, becomes an idol. Because you're always just, you know, everything is about your spouse, you're serving, you know. I'm not saying that you should not love each other and honor and serve each other, no. But is it taking the place where, which you should give to God and God alone? So anything that occupies the first priority in your life, many, many homes, even Christian homes today, are child-centered homes, which is a big mistake. Because you become, you make your child the idol. The child becomes the object of worship. Everything about your life is dictated by your child. No, that, don't make that mistake. Remember this. The home primarily is the husband and wife. You know, my wife and I, we told our children a long time back that we are the home. We are the family. You are joining us. It is not going to be about you. This home is, belongs to Christ, and we will provide the leadership. Your job is to follow us. So you are not the center of this home. We made it very clear to our children. Should, we should not only verbalize it, but we should actually practice it also, that we don't make our children the center of our home. The center of our home has to be Christ and Christ alone. No one else, nothing else should take the place of worship in our lives. So we praise him for his mighty power and also we praise him for his surpassing greatness. Now remember, all this is about praise. It's not about worship. Praise. We praise him for what he's done. We praise him for his greatness. It is focused on his character and his majesty, on who he is, God's personality and his character. How to praise God, verses 3 and 5. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Now, this doesn't mean that on your way back home from here that you go to a music shop and buy all these instruments. That's not what it means. What it means is that each of these instruments represents a certain stage of your life or certain 
mood of your life. Some instruments are used for warning, like the trumpet. The trumpet call means it's a warning sign. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sign of alertness. There are some instruments here which are talking about a melancholic mood in your life where things are a bit low. There are some instruments which are used for dance and for rejoicing. So basically what it means, how to praise God, you praise God at all times, at all seasons of your life. Whether you're happy, whether you're not happy, whether you're going through a tough time, whether you're going through a good time, at a comfortable time, whether you're comfortable or uncomfortable, you just praise God. Why? Praise does not depend upon who we are or how we feel. Praise depends upon the character and the nature of God on who God is. And he never, ever falls short of deserving praise. He always deserves praise because he is the king of kings, he is the lord of lords, he is the mighty one. God has to be praised at all times. How do you praise him? With everything that you have, with all the stages and moods of your life, you praise God. With all of your strength, what does the Bible tell us? What is the command that God has given us? Love the Lord your God, how? With all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul and strength, which means what? In this context, all means all. It means complete with everything that is in you, with your good times, your bad times, the difficult moments, the, the easy moments, with everything consistently. You love the Lord, you praise him, you worship him. Hallelujah. Who is to praise God? Verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Do you have breath? If the answer is yes, praise the Lord. It is your responsibility and my responsibility to praise the Lord because the dead do not praise the Lord. It is only the living who praise the Lord. And you know what? We will all die physically but we will be raised up in the resurrection. This is, a, this is the promise that God has given us. And this is the destiny that he's taking us. He will raise us up to be in his presence, in the manifest presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So let everything that has breath praise him. So when we did the word study, I'm just going to go quickly. In the Old Testament, there are various words that are used in Hebrew for praise. And these are some of the meanings that came out of those words. It means praise. It means to bring glory to God. It means to sing songs of praise. Now many times we confine praise only to songs and music. It is not confined to songs. It is one of the tools that we use to express our praise of God. Then another word means to confess. Actually, we, we make a confession to God that, Lord, you're worthy of praise. And we take confession from others. We listen to the confession of others as they praise God. So remember, praise is always about God. It's not about you. you know, so we have to be careful even the kind of songs that we choose. For example, there are songs which are good songs and no harm sing singing them. For example, there's a song that says, I am a child of God. And it keeps repeating affirmation that I am a child of God. It's a good song, but is it a praise song? Because a praise song has to be about who? About God. It has to be about Jesus. It has to be about God. It's not about me. It's not about you. I mean, there are, it is okay to sing about, if you look at many psalms, you see the psalmist singing their emotions to God. It is fine. But if all our songs are about my comfort, my joy, and about me and about you, and that is not praise. That is us singing about ourselves. Praise has to be always about God. It has to be unto him. You look at all the old hymns. I don't, I, I don't remember seeing a single hymn which talks about self. Every old hymn birthed from scriptures always talked about the majesty of God, the goodness of God, the judgment of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God. It's all about God, 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 and Him alone. Another meaning from another word was to, be, to bless, 
to be filled with strength, to be full, to be adored, to, to give your adoration to God, for God to be adored. Another word means to admire and to boast. You're boasting about God, you're admiring God, you're saying, you're talking to God about his attributes, about, you know, your, your mind is just filled with his attributes. You're talking to God about that. Another, another word came out with the meaning of to play an instrument, to come and give a communal sacrifice of praise, thanksgiving of praise, choir, doxology, all these were the meanings that came out of the word praise from the Old Testament. And by the way, there are more words. I just selected a few. If you go to the New Testament and take Greek words from which the word praise has been tra translated into the English language, you find these kind of meanings. To praise, to bless, to bring glory, uh, to have an opinion, high opinion about God, to talk to God about the expectations about his, from, from his character, the expectations are unto you, the honor that you bring to God, the greatness of God. Another word has the meaning of God being praiseworthy, that, that you approve of God's greatness, that you bring glory to God and God alone, you bring honor and that you think highly of God. Another word translates as that God is generous. Uh, you bring generous gifts unto God and you bring fine language unto God. You, you actually praise God and you're careful about your language, how you, how you talk to God. You confess. You agree that God is great. You give thanks and you profit allegiance to him. And you admit that he's great and you bring praises unto him. So I believe that we've had an understanding now of the word praise. Praise is talking and expressing from our heart. We are expressing to God about his greatness of who he is. What about worship? Shall we turn to John chapter 4 verse 23? Actually, you should read the whole chapter. This is the encounter that Jesus had with uh, the Samaritan woman and, and in their conversation. And then he comes to verse 23 when this Samaritan woman finally is confronted with the sins of her life. She now starts to make a deviation like all of us do. Then she went to, into denominational discussions. She says, we worship on this mountain. Our forefathers gave this place to us for worship. And then Jesus says, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Now, worship is not something that we do. Yes, it is something that we do, but not in the sense of a duty. It is a lifestyle change, which is worship. And we did a study on the word worship from the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, in the, from the Hebrew root words, these are the meanings that came out. To till, to till the ground, to plow the ground, to toil, to work hard, to work, to serve, to accomplish some results, to do, to be reduced to servitude. Basically, worship is becoming a slave, a servant. Actually, wherever the word servant is used in the New Testament, it comes from the root word doulos, which doesn't really mean servant, which means slave. Somebody watered down the translation from slave to servant. You know, servant has rights, servant gets wages. Slave has no rights, slave gets no wages. Slave has only one duty, obey the master, that's it. That's the call of a slave's life. So you and I, as born again Christians, God calls us his children but our actual position is that of slaves doulos we are meant to serve God but God doesn't treat us mistreat us as our previous master sin who abused us misused us and oppressed us God elevates us gives us sonship gives us inheritance but yet let us not forget we are doulos we are not even servants. We are slaves of God. And that is worship. Serving God without question. Serving him without conditions. Serving him at his very word. 
not, in, not according to how we want. You know, in the modern age, Christians are so comfortable that we worship God at our terms. We praise God at our terms. We ask God for something and it doesn't happen in our life and then we are angry with God. That should not be. In all situation, God is worthy and he is worthy to be praised because of his character and because of his greatness, not because how we feel. It is also to mean to bow down, to revere, and to worship, to fear, to be afraid, to tremble, to be scared of. Where is the reverence today for God? You know, many people come to God with a very buddy-buddy attitude. God is your buddy. He's not your buddy. He is the God who spoke and things came into creation. Can you imagine, if, have you seen that, that uh, presentation by Louis Giglio, which uh, is entitled uh, Indescribable? He explains over there something, you know, just, just for imagination. You know the, the, the speed at which light travels? The light can go, I don't know how many times in one second round the equator, maybe 13, 14 times, around 136, I don't know, I, I don't remember the quantity, 136,000 miles per hour. When God spoke, let there be light, it is at that speed that light came out of his mouth. So could you stand there? Could you withstand that? It was like a nuclear explosion that would consume everything on its path. This is the great God that you're serving. God spoke and life came into being. Can you and I ever treat God as our buddy? If that is your attitude, change it today, please. Let there be reverence and fear because worship involves fear. It involves coming to God with reverence, with a deep sense of respect unto God. You cannot just walk into the presence of, of God like he's, you know, he's your buddy. He's not your buddy. It is to pay homage and it is to bring honor. It is to be in awe of God. You know, nowadays we use the word awesome for everything. You go to a movie, you like the movie, you say, oh, it's, it's an awesome movie. Oh, the ice cream was awesome, you know. Awesome is a word that should be reserved only for God. Not for any of our experience. You go for a, for a roller coaster ride and it's awesome. What will you say when you come face to face with God? <laughs> if you call a roller co coaster ride awesome, what will, you, what will you say when you come face to face with God? What's the words that you, you're going to use at that time? You see that picture of worship in Revelation chapter 4. Go and read Revelation chapter 4. The angels, the beings, the celestial beings are worshipping God continuously. You know, somebody once said, isn't it going to be boring in, in heaven if all we're going to do is worship? But the picture that you see in Revelation chapter 4, there is continuous worship. And why is there continuous worship? Is it something that's being forced upon the people? No, it's not. They're doing it willingly. The angelic beings are continuously worshipping God. Why? This is the scenario that I can picture. There is continual revelation of who God is and his greatness. God reveals to us how he created the earth. And it is such a spectacular, awesome, you know, picture that we have no strength to do anything else but to fall down and worship him and say, wow. And just as we are getting up from that moment of wow, God reveals another aspect about himself and then we fall down again and say, wow. And again, when we are getting up from that, God reveals another facet of, of himself and then we go down again and say, wow. And this is not something that is boring. This is something that is the, the almighty one, the one, is, one who is from everlasting to everlasting, is revealing to mortal beings, his greatness, and therefore there is continuous awe and wonder of who this God is. And that inspires worship in our life. And what is worship? If you go to the New Testament, in the, from the Greek words, it means to bow down. It means to make obe obeisance, which means total obedience. To fall down and worship, to do reverence, to serve, to work for hire to be in servitude of God, 
to show reverence, to be afraid, fear, be frightened, to be terrified. If you look at all the encounters in the Bible, whenever the angel of the Lord, not even God himself, when God sent a messenger, who is an angel? An angel is a messenger. When God sends his messenger, the awe of that messenger is so great that the people who encountered those messengers said, I'm going to die. I have seen something which I cannot withhold and withstand because sin cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. And that is why people would die, fall down dead when they walked in sin, Ananias and Sapphira. Flesh and sin cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. It is only, and this is the importance of why the Bible teaches us again and again, that we need to come with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. It is in the place of brokenness where the flesh is crucified. When you own up and say, I am a sinner, Lord. I am weak. It is in that place where there is safety and security because that is the place where you are nailing the flesh down and you are coming into the presence of God recognizing that he is a holy God. I pray that our attitude should change. Our attitude should change that we bring true praise. What are the worshippers that God is looking for? He is seeking people who will worship him in truth and in spirit. And what is to worship God in truth and in spirit? Is to obey God, is to obey God, and it's to obey God. Your life, when it is marked with obedience to the will of God, that becomes your true worship. And therefore, we cannot sing worship songs. We actually live worship every day of our life. We do not do worship, we live worship. So in conclusion, I want to say this. What is praise? Praise is our awe-filled reaction to the progressive revelation of God's person and his greatness and his works and his acts of power. This is praise. Praise is our, our expression of wow to God. Say, God, you're great. You're majestic. And you're expressing your in your own words, in your own lifestyle, you're expressing the greatness of God. What is worship? Worship is an awe-inspired life transformation as a result of knowing God. You cannot worship God without knowing God. Without having an intimate relationship with him, you cannot worship God. So worshiping God is not just coming and having goosebumps and raising your hands and having a serene look on your face. That is not worship. Worship is obedience, obedience, obedience. When, if you take the whole Bible, you condense it, what is the essence of what God wants from us? Number one, be holy as I am holy. Number two, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Number three, Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I've taught you, and lo, I'm with you to the end of the ages. These three things are the center of our worship. When we become holy as he is holy, when we love the Lord genuinely and love people, which is the expression of our love for God, is expressed, and the proof of it is in our love for people, and if you love people, you will not want them to go to hell. You will preach the gospel. When you see a fellow believer walking in error, you will confront them. You know, we have a wrong definition about love. We think love means sweeping things under the carpet. It means being politically correct. It means seeing somebody walking in error and say, okay, I will not make that person uncomfortable. I will not confront that person. I will allow that person to continue in that behavior, but I will just provide that person my fellowship, and that is my act of love. No, that is not an act of love. In fact, that is an act of hate. 
Because if you love a person and you see that person walking in the path of error, you will take the uncomfortable step of going and standing on that person's face, confronting that person and saying, your walk is not right, my brother, my sister. If you continue down this path, you will go into destruction. I love you. I care for you. And I cannot allow you to go down that path of destruction. And therefore, I'm going to stand at your face. I'm going to make you uncomfortable. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to try to do everything that I can to change your life to the correct path. The Bible tells us why it is the highway that leads to destruction and why it is the gate through and many are traveling through that highway. It is easy to be politically correct. It is easy to compromise. But the Bible tells us that narrow is the path that leads to heaven and narrow is the gate and it is very few who find it. But praise God. He has not allowed us alone in this difficult path. He is walking ahead of us. Jesus said, come unto me, all of you who are heavy laden and who are burdened, and come, enter into a yoke relationship with me, and I will give you rest. He is with us in that journey. But what we need to do, we need to give our commitment and our obedience to him and to him alone. God is looking for genuine praise, not lip service. And God is looking for genuine and true worshipers. What is the definition of praise? What is the definition of worship? I hope it has changed today. I hope that you've been reminded of the true meaning of what it is to praise and worship and who you are as one who praises God and one who worships God and who God is to be worthy of praise and worthy of all obedience, obedience, obedience from our life. Praise be to God. Pastor Sam, please come.